Next, we're going to talk about solving least squares problems or the minimum mean squared error filtering problem, which we showed was equivalent, using an iterative algorithm based on gradient descent. And in the signal processing community, this algorithm is known as the least mean square algorithm or LMS. Now, the least squares problem, which correspond to minimum mean squared error filtering, involved having an error which was the difference between a signal D of n and the inner product of data X of n with a set of weights W. And our goal was to find the set of weights W to minimize the mean squared error or the squared error over some interval from L1 to L1 plus cap L minus 1. We can rewrite this in vector form as a vector E being equal to vector D minus matrix X transpose times W and then our cost function or squared error is just E transpose E and this is equivalent to finding the W that minimizes the squared error between D and X transpose W. I've indicated our definitions of E we're just taking the vector as samples of the individual elements in the sum, similarly for D, and then the matrix X has rows given by the various X transpose vectors that we had in our original problem here. And in the time series case, the X transpose vectors are just past samples up to capital N of them of the input time series. But in general, these can just be rows of a matrix if we're trying to solve a least squares problem. So it works for the time series. If you interpret these x's as rows of a matrix x, then it works for a general least squares problem. And we saw that the solution to this problem of minimizing the squared error was obtained using the normal equations, which if we write in terms of x, it's x times x transpose w is equal to x plus d, or we had defined an r and a p corresponding to x, x transpose, and x d, and that was another way of writing the normal equations. So the direct solution to the normal equations, w is equal to r inverse times p. Now there are several challenges with this particular solution. First of all, the number of observations or data vectors that we require, L has to be greater than or equal to the dimension of W, which was capital N. Secondly, matrix inversion is fairly expensive, especially if N is large, because the cost to invert R is on the order of N to the cube. Now that's not bad if N is a couple hundred or maybe a couple thousand, but as N starts getting in the tens of thousands or millions, it becomes problematic. It also depends on whether you're trying to do this in real time before the next set of data comes in or whether you're doing this offline as well, whether you can afford the time to do the matrix inversion. Another question is what happens if we get new data? How do we update this solution? And this approach of forming the normal equations doesn't really give us any ideas how to do an update other than to recompute the matrix R and recompute the matrix inverse, which is pretty expensive. And furthermore, if L and N are very big, then you may not be able to store this matrix X in your memory. So even computing R could be a challenging task. Another challenge with the normal equation approach is that if I look at the dynamic range, in other words, sort of the largest component relative to the smallest component of R, that's the square of the dynamic range for X. Multiplying X times X transpose ends up squaring the dynamic range, and that can be a problem if there's a very large ratio of the largest to smallest component in X, we square that ratio in R. So suppose that ratio is 10 to the 10th in X, then it's 10 to the 20th in R, and that leads to numerical difficulties with calculations. So what we'd really like is to have a low computational cost iterative solution to this problem that avoids some of these difficulties.
and we're going to take a gradient descent based on an instantaneous error or the so-called least mean square algorithm approach in this lecture. And the basic idea is that you update your current guess or your current solution w and we're going to add an index n here to indicate that this is the solution at instant n. We're going to update that by going downhill. So we're going to take a step in the negative gradient direction of the instantaneous error e squared of n. So I can write this as the new solution w at step n plus 1 is equal to the solution at time or step n plus mu over 2 times the gradient at step n. And I'm using this division by 2 just for convenience because the 2 is going to go away later. And the gradient, g, is defined as the partial with respect to the vector w at time n of the error. Looks maybe a little intimidating, but all it means is that we're forming a vector by taking the partial with respect to each of the components of w. So the first element of this vector, this gradient vector, is going to have the partial with respect to w0 of e squared, then the partial with respect to w1 of e squared, and then finally the partial with respect to w sub n minus 1 of e squared. So let's look at finding this gradient. Well, we can use the chain rule and take the derivative with respect to e squared and write that as 2 times e of n times the derivative of e of n. And so we'll substitute in our definition for this vector gradient and we see that we're taking the derivative with respect to each component of w of d of n minus x transpose of n w of n. Well, d of n doesn't involve w, so that's going to drop out, and we're simply going to be left with taking the derivative of this inner product with respect to each element of the vector w, and we can expand the inner product and find that when we differentiate with respect to the elf element, we just pick out x of n minus l. So that's a particular element of the vector x, and when I differentiate with respect to all of these different values of L, we obtain the gradient as 2 times E of n times X of n down through X of lowercase n minus capital N plus 1. And in our notation, this is just 2 E of n times the vector X of n. I remember the vector X of n, if we move away from the time series construct, the vector X of n is simply a column of the matrix capital X. So if we substitute the definition for the gradient, which we just found, into our update, we end up with the so-called LMS algorithm. So we've got to start someplace, and I'm going to assume that time zero or step zero is our starting point, and somewhat arbitrarily put that starting point at the origin. So our initial vector w is all zeros, that's the initialization. Then we calculate the error, which will just at step n, which is d at step n minus x transpose of n w of n. And once we have the error, we can update our solution for w. So w at step n plus 1 is just the w at step n plus mu times e of n times x of n. The second term, recall, was negative mu over 2 times the gradient, and that simplifies to mu times e of n x of n. Then we'll increment n and repeat this process. So we're iterating through this algorithm. Now let's look at some of the features of this algorithm, which I've il illustrated by first putting the two equations that we update at the top here. And with respect to computational cost, in order to compute E of n, the dominant effect is that I've got to do this inner product between x and w. Well, those are each n-dimensional vectors, so this takes on the order of capital N multiplications. Now, to update w to the next time step, or the next iteration, 
the main computation I have to do is multiply e of n times the vector x of n. And x also is n-dimensional again, so this means multiplying e into n elements of x. That's another order n multiplications. So the net computation here is on the order capital N at each time step. And if you compare that to computing R inverse P, we had to implement order N cubed operations. So at each iteration, this is a much, much lower complexity algorithm than computing the normal equations. In terms of memory, all we need in memory at any given point in time is the current value of D, the current value of X, and the current value of W. And since these are n-dimensional vectors, this means we need to store on the order of capital N values at any given time. And recall, if we were going to do the normal equations, we were going to have to, say, store X and D, and that takes on the order of L times N storage locations, since X is an L by N matrix. Finally, this algorithm is really ideal and is designed for sequential scenarios where you want to update the solution as new data is measured. And this allows us to potentially track a time-varying solution and basically allow our iteration to run indefinitely. As long as we can afford the order n multiplications it takes at each step, we can just keep stepping as long as we want, millions, hundreds of millions, billions of steps. Now the convergence behavior of this algorithm depends a lot on step size and it's actually a fairly complex topic to study. And we'll look at some of the aspects around convergence behavior in the next video.